Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, whichever part of the world you're in. We will begin by acknowledging today's, um, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands um, on which this event is taking place, which may be multiple lands given the location of all of you. For me, currently here at Melbourne University, that's the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kuli Nations. And um, we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and the place of Indigenous knowledge in the academy, and also extend this recognition and respect to any Indigenous peoples who may be joining us today. Yes, Tita B, welcome to our um, forum this afternoon titled Contextualizing Disaster Justice perspectives and provocations from the Philippines. My name is Oscar T. Serkinia Jr., an associate professor in the Department of Speech, Communication, and Theater Arts at UP Diliman. I am a member of CERN, the collective that is in charge of organizing today's event. And Tita B, you might want to introduce yourself. Yes, also known as Tita B. I am Bonita Cabiles. I am a lecturer here at the Faculty of Education at the University of Melbourne. I joined CERN when I was still a PhD student, and it has been a very productive experience. It's great to see everyone here again. This is kind of a mini reunion, I think, for most of us. And so um, while we celebrate this um, momentous uh, you know, a, a milestone. We also um, feel this um, familiarity, I think, and sense of camaraderie and solidarity in this space. Yeah, CERN was established in 2019. It is a network or a collective of Melbourne and Manila-based Filipino postgraduate students, PhD researchers, lecturers, and alumni of Australian universities with research interests in the Philippines. Since its establishment, members um, have been conducting brown bag sessions, talks such as this, that examine issues that are at the junctures of urban planning, development studies, architecture, education, art, performance and communication, law, ecology, etc. So CERN has been very persistent. Um, to do all of these things pro bono for the love of research, scholarship, and even activism. Great. So just some housekeeping for the session today. Um, we will be having um, a, pa a panel speakers, um, that six um, panel speakers, and then each panel speakers will be given 10 to 15 minutes for their presentations. We will try to stay on time. So OJ and I will actually be giving you, if that's okay with you, um, signs, but it's already five minutes or two minutes. And then um, after the panel speakers, we will have three discussants who will give their insights based on the presentations. And after that, we will each discussant will have five minutes um, to share their thoughts. And then after that, we will have um, an open Q&A session. Um, you can submit your questions via the chat and OJ and I will be monitoring that with the assistance of some of the members of CERN as well. Um, also, um, as Rudan mentioned, this um, webinar is being recorded. So if you are not comfortable with having yourself um, being recorded, you can also um, turn off your cameras. Yeah. And to get us started, I would like to introduce our first moderator for this afternoon's talk. Um, Reden Torresho is research fellow at the University of Melbourne's Informal Urbanism Hub and currently serves on the editorial board of Planning Theory and Practice Journal. His work interrogates issues at the juncture of urban planning, informality, development studies, social inclusion, and grassroots collective action, among others. Our second presenter is Dakila Kim Lee. Dakila is an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines, Tacloban's Division of Social Sciences, where he teaches courses on sociology and institutional analysis. His research interest is on the urban political ecology of disaster reconstruction in the Philippines, critical environmental conservation studies, and the state civil society relationship on environmental issues in the Philippines. 
Our next speaker is Justin C., a postdoctoral research fellow at the Sydney Environment Institute and is affiliated with the School of Geosciences at the University of Sydney. As a human geographer, his research looks into the intersecting dimensions of power, injustice, and inequality reflected in the planning and implementation of climate change adaptation projects across space, class, and time. Another one of our speakers is Pamela Gloria Cahilig, is a professional lecturer and design anthropologist at the College of Architecture, University of the Philippines, Diliman. She is a global fellow at the Brown University Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies, as well as an associate at the World Wildlife Fund USA Environment and Disaster Management Program. Our penultimate speaker is Monica um, Santos, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Anthropology at UP Diliman, where she specializes in social cultural anthropology, linguistic anthropology, and the anthropology of human movement. And finally, we have Kyra Zo Alboro Cañete. Feminist scholar with training in anthropology and critical development studies. She is currently senior researcher at the Humanitarian Studies Center at the International Institute of Social Studies in the Hague, the Netherlands. So welcome everyone. We are very excited and we'll over to you, Reden, our first speaker. Then we cannot hear you. You are still on mute. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thanks, Bonita and uh, OJ. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I know most of you are uh, located from different parts of the globe. I think we're organizing this on multiple time zones. So let me just uh, share my screen. I think it's here now. So uh, my role here is really to provide a context to this special issue and uh, explain how the CERN Collective decided to put together a special issue, why explain why the disaster justice lens is crucial to interrogating disaster-related issues, practices, and uh, concepts in the Philippines, and what it entails for engaged and critical scholars working on and in the Philippines. And I'm really uh, pleased to be just editing this special issue with uh, Kyra and Pamela, Pamela or Pam, who are also going to share their insights later this afternoon. The idea to put together a special issue on disaster justice was conceived in November 20, when Typhoon Ulysses, uh, international name Vamco, affected a number of provinces in the Philippines, while most of the country was still reeling from the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic. It began with us three guest editors, so me, Kyra, and Pamela, talking about our discomfort with the way some government officials and media practitioners have deployed narratives around Filipino resilience to mobilize support for typhoon hit communities. You know, these accounts, many of these accounts either place the burden of resilience on individuals rather than socio political systems in the Philippines, or misconceived resilience as a genetic trait. So, uh, exemplified in, you know, phrases and slogans such as, you know, resilience is in the Filipino blood. In so doing, these narratives actually failed to articulate how the broader political structures and socioeconomic inequality have forced communities and households to bear the disproportionate impacts of many disasters in our country. And as many of you are familiar with our Philippine context, these impacts are normally a product of the decisions and inactions by powerful forces and economic actors. 
So while we recognize that, you know, we have a centuries long of experience of people and communities relying on each other, on our self-organized practices, our sustained conversations with uh, each other and with other members of CERN convince us of the need to foreground deeper questions about political accountability and institutional neglect alongside and even socioeconomic vulnerabilities in many disaster affected communities in the country. Also, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Rebecca Solnit, one of the progressive writers uh, consistently talking about disasters and hope. She wrote of the importance of hope amid crisis and emergency situations. She, she says, one of our main tasks, especially those of us who are not sick, who are not frontliners, and are not dealing with other economic or housing difficulties, is to understand this moment, what it might require of us, and what it might make possible. So for us, this special issue and the sustained effort to organize a series of discussions are our collective responses to Solnit's invitation to chronicle and reflect on some of the critical lessons, not only about the COVID-19 pandemic, but also about other devastating disasters, as well as seemingly mundane problems that many Filipinos endure every single day. So you might be asking why disaster justice and what questions were we trying to interrogate in putting together this uh, special issue. We all know that as a country, the Philippines has repeatedly ranked first in the world risk index due to hazard exposure and limited capacities to withstand and overcome disaster. And much of the recent work on disasters in the Philippines have significantly contributed to our understanding of the socioeconomic, political, technical, and material dimensions of disaster experiences. And among the most important insights that can be gleaned from this uh, studies have to do with uh, historical, social, spatial, and institutional processes that impact or shape the way we are able to withstand the impacts of the disaster. And therefore, in this special issue, these are the three questions that we've been trying to interrogate through the different articles. How might existing concepts or new theoretical frames enrich the notion of disaster justice and its application to the Philippines? How might disaster justice lenses inform disaster interventions and policy frameworks? And how is this notion reflected in existing practices, state policies, and grassroots initiatives? So here, disaster justice is framed as a political, moral, and ethical claim in governance, which places a moral and legal responsibility on the state to protect and advance the rights of all its citizens, most particularly the marginalized and most vulnerable communities. A disaster justice lens foregrounds the political in the analysis of social environmental crisis and embraces its entanglements with the cultural, material, and ecological forces that contributed to the so-called natural disasters. We believe that employing a disaster justice prism prompts us to avoid the romance and overreach of narratives around apolitical notions of resilience that normally entrap our political imaginations in times of crisis. And therefore, we urge everyone to focus on the lived experiences of resilience and disaster impacts. And for us, addressing those questions, engaging with those questions, demands a serious engagement with government policies and regulatory practices. In particular, we have actually encouraged the authors to frame policy and other 
state instruments not as an external factor that are confined to legal texts or rigid bureaucratic procedures, but instead as a constitutive force that partially shapes the life worlds and lived experiences of communities in our sites of scholarship. For us, this analytical approach challenges the tendency of many scholars in the Philippines and other parts of the globe to reproduce research studies that largely mobilize fashionable concepts or policy buzzwords like future proof, smart cities, without necessarily foregrounding the underlying ideologies or interests embedded in such appealing phrases. Most of the time, the constant rehearsal of these trendy tropes leads to what the scholar Tom Slater has called policy-driven research at the expense of research-driven policy. And by extension, we argue, these tropes also encourage more state decision-based evidence gathering at the expense of evidence-informed decision-making. So in this special issue, we believe that the empirically rich articles move beyond the usual disaster-related buzzwords and foreground three in intersecting themes. One is the importance of looking at the grassroots agency and contestation amid uncertainty. The importance of looking at democratic processes in post-disaster contexts. And then of course, the material, looking at the materiality of injustice and hope, especially in post-disaster contexts. The research articles and the reflective essays offer conceptual provocations and urge Filipino researchers and other disaster scholars to deepen the path, enlarge and expand our research and our understanding of disaster justice practices in the Philippines and other parts of the globe. The special issue ends with a gallery of images, what we call photo gallery, with reflections from researchers with personal experiences of Yolanda and its aftermath to commemorate the Yolanda. We're now commemorating the 10th year of the super typhoon. When you have a copy later on of the, the, the special issue, you will see that the photos we've included, we've chosen, capture the emerging as well as the enduring issues faced by many Yolanda affected households and communities. Forced relocation, precarious livelihoods, contested rural and urban zones, and fragile futures. Yet some images also reveal center the various collective and individual acts to remain hopeful, to transgress unresponsive state regulations such as the one that you saw here, and to reclaim space to improve their living conditions and repair their world so that they can live in it as well as possible. In all of this, hope animates and is materialized in practices that insist on living a dignified life. And this is exemplified in this photo. So a picture of a woman tending to her garden against the backdrop of a mountain of garbage, which poignantly affirms the resident's dogged determination to survive and confront really different forms of devastation and dehumanization brought on by Yolanda, but also by the government's post typhoon interventions, the unresponsive and insensitive post typhoon interventions. So we have coordinated this special project, but the entire initiative, as Bonita and uh, OJ pointed out as well, is part of the CERN's wider goal to generate scholarly platforms that interrogate issues relevant to the Philippines. And in putting together this special issue, we recognize our, what we call distinct epistemic positionality. What do we mean by that? So as Filipino scholars, 
who have been affiliated with Global North institutions, you know, Australian, American, and Dutch universities, we are in a way detached from the everyday socio-political issues in the Philippines, but we also have have been very familiar with some of these issues because we grew up and we have worked with some communities in the Philippines. At the same time, our Global North Association has afforded us some access to privilege and resources. And therefore, that kind of epistemic positionality is also something that we recognize. But while we embrace that kind of epistemic positionality, the entire collection draws on different experiences of fellow scholars. In fact, the final section of this, the SI, the photo gallery, centers the positionality of the scholars involved in this collection. It draws attention to their lived experiences and affective entanglements with the sites of scholarship. For us, you know, articulating such research re reflexivity helps us locate the authors, what uh, colleagues Gautamban and uh, some other Global South scholars call ethos of inquiry to better understand how our personal geographies, our affective entanglements shape the way we frame, construe, and interrogate the geographies of knowledge on disaster justice. So everyone, we invite you to engage with the special issue, but also with the provocative arguments that will be put forward by fellow scholars who would be speaking after me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rodan. Um, and now we move on to the second speaker, Dakila Kimi. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you um, to uh, turn for uh, the invitation uh, for this uh, special issue and at the same time uh, for the uh, opportunity to also share uh, the research to um, uh, the uh, broader audience. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, Riden, uh, Pam, uh, Kyra, and of course uh, to our moderators for today, uh, Bonita and um, OJ. And also for our um, discussants, uh, Tin, uh, Erin, and uh, Ika, I thank you very much. And of course, uh, for everyone who uh, is uh, here, um, good afternoon from uh, the Philippines. Um, so uh, I'll be uh, um, sharing uh, my uh, presentation. Um, and I believe I have around 10 minutes. So uh, wait. <laughs> I edited something uh, while uh, Redden was talking, so uh, wait, sorry. Uh, can you uh, no, see the screen already? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, just a brief uh, background regarding uh, this uh, um, paper. Uh, I uh, the, the first time that I uh, shared um, this uh, paper was uh, in a conference in uh, uh, the National uh, University of Singapore Asia Research Institute. Uh, in 2016, uh, they organized a conference on uh, disaster justice in Anthropocene Asia and the Pacific. And um, the purpose of that uh, event was uh, also to uh, same here uh, with the uh, purpose of uh, of CERN was to uh, try to make sense of the concept of disaster justice. Um, although at the, at that particular level, it was uh, trying to think about the concept at uh, regional uh, scale. Uh, my my presentation was uh, supposed uh, part of it was uh, part of the. Um, Supposed uh, outcome was uh, for the paper to uh, be a part of the uh, for one of the first uh, in the volume one of environment and planning e uh, they had a special uh, in the first volume of that uh, year I think in twenty eighteen they had a special issue on uh, disaster justice um, but uh, my paper wasn't uh, 
but they didn't make it to the final uh, lineup. But uh, in a lot of ways, um, I think it's uh, good that it happened because it also allowed uh, for um, some form of uh, reflection to happen uh, because uh, the it. Uh, this paper is actually uh, seven years in the making. It's the longest paper that I have written to date. But the longer time frame also allowed for um, the uh, observation of the events as it unfolded. Uh, and part of that uh, was really the, the shift in the political opportunity that was given uh, to uh, the social movement uh, people surge when there was a change in the uh, political administration. So I wouldn't have had that opportunity to uh, see the, the shift if the paper uh, saw through the, uh, uh, made it to the publication. So uh, just a caveat in this presentation, uh, some of the terms might uh, use uh, terms from uh, social movement theory. Uh, so um, please have very, uh, bear with me na lang if I uh, use uh, those particular concepts. So um, this is a path of uh, Typhoon Yolanda. I think uh, uh, for those who are uh, are engaged in uh, disasters research in the Philippines, uh, this might be a, a map uh, that is very, uh, um, very uh, like common already. Uh, but at the same time, in 2013, there were also a lot of uh, disasters that happened. Like a month before Typhoon Yolanda hit, uh, there was a very strong earthquake in Bohol, uh, magnitude 7, I think, uh, which killed around 200 people. So in, in that sense, it was already a very uh, big disaster. But uh, Yolanda was uh, one of the biggest uh, disasters um, in, in contemporary uh, Philippine uh, history. And uh, it uh, made landfall in uh, first in Giwan, Eastern Samar, but then um, uh, really made a second landfall in uh, Tolosa, uh, around 20 kilometers south of Tacloban. But uh, most of the damage is really uh, to the north of the landfall site, uh, the city of Tacloban, towns of Palo, and then uh, uh, Tanawan. Uh, and Part of the explanation for the damage is really that these uh, three towns, uh, especially Tacloban and Palo, can be considered as a, uh, an urban agglomeration already. Uh, Tacloban has around 250,000 people, but uh, Palo, uh, its next town, is around 50,000 already. So there's already a concentration of a population in these particular towns. So, um, the utility of disaster justice. So uh, this is uh, uh, the organizers of the conference that I mentioned, uh, Mike Douglas and Michelle Miller, uh, have, have, a, have a paper on uh, disaster justice. Uh, and they uh, thresh out the, uh, the utility of this particular concept. Uh, this is a relatively new concept, uh, actually. Um, in, uh, I think uh, it really started to gain traction around 2012. I think it's the first time that it was used in, a, in an academic paper. Although, of course, the concepts related to justice is, uh, uh, during disasters is, is relatively, uh, is, is most definitely um, uh, has been around for before that. But um, as an academic concept, uh, it's relatively new. Um, it is uh, related to uh, uh, more established uh, justice uh, frameworks like environmental justice and climate justice. And uh, I'm uh, just outlining some of the basic uh, assumptions in these uh, two uh, schools of uh, justice uh, as uh, summarized by uh, David uh, Schlossberg, who is uh, the boss of uh, uh, my co-panelist, uh, Justin uh, Distributive, um, for lack of a better term, uh, is uh, concerned with uh, allocative or fair allocation of uh, resources. Uh, procedural uh, would refer to um, justice concerns related to um, participation and uh, participation of people in uh, governing or governance processes. And uh, recognition is um, more uh, in line with um, how uh, groups of marginalized, uh, marginalized people are um, given their due recognition. Uh, 
So I think, uh, for example, if you were here at the start of the um, event, uh, there was a land uh, recognition or a land acknowledgement. So I think that constitutes uh, part of the process of uh, justice, uh, recognition as justice. But uh, there is also um, uh, uh, a need to try to uh, think of disaster justice as something that is uh, distinct. And uh, Douglas and Miller highlighted um, uh, temporal urgency and uh, spatial concentration. So, for example, uh, justice uh, disaster justice concerns are very immediate. Uh, they are concerned with um, aid uh, after disasters, and uh, these concerns might not surface in um, climate justice debates or environmental justice debates. Uh, and uh, climate justice and environmental debates are also um, sometimes embedded in longer uh, temporal processes. For example, uh, this December, there will be a conference of parties in Doha, I think. Um, some uh, executives from, uh, from some LG officials from Eastern Visayas will be joining this event. Uh, but uh, so, but, but these processes uh, are seem to be embedded in longer time temporal cycles but disasters uh, have a sense of urgency that uh, makes it particularly uh, distinct um, and also the idea of spatial concentration um, which uh, and it's related to the idea of the of localization um, but I'll, I'll try to uh, move uh, go, go go ahead to uh, the other parts of the presentation. But also, I also want to touch on the uh, issue of uh, state society and uh, disasters uh, nexus, and basically um, how disaster justice can frame uh, the collapse of a social contract uh, during disasters. So uh, in the works of, for example, Siddiqui, uh, Yoshi Siddiqui and uh, Joel Kanudai, uh, they, uh, they focus on uh, how processes of social contract is built up between uh, communities and the state uh, during uh, the aftermath of disasters, but I want to focus on how it is rendered as, uh, as uh, ineffective, or how it is uh, made, uh, um, or how 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 it is being um, uh, attacked, for a lack of a better term. So uh, these are some of the basic stats, uh, statistics regarding Tacloban. Uh, we're just focusing on the official data, um, although um, for some of you who are from uh, Leyte, uh, there is also the uh, the on the ground um, interpretations of these data. Uh, for example, the number of deaths may not necessarily be six thousand only, but could go as uh, yes, ten thousand to fifteen thousand. Um, of course, um, there are interesting uh, contexts of the global. Uh, uh, there is uh, recognition of its growth as. Uh, um, being tied to um, the, the long history of the dictator Ferdinand Marcos. And so a lot of infrastructural investment in the city happened during this time, which uh, partly uh, structures uh, the uh, political conflict with the Aquino regime, as uh, pointed out by uh, uh, Pauline Iadi in her 2019 article. So this is a site where I did my field work in 2015 to 2016. So these are the questions. How was disaster justice articulated? How did the demand for disaster justice uh, render the social contract problematic? And how did the change in political opportunity affect uh, the demand for disaster justice? So uh, the focus of this article uh, was on uh, social movement organization, uh, People Surge. Um, they, they are a social movement organization that emerged after Typhoon Yolanda. According to Porato, Ong, and Lumboan, uh, they uh, use uh, quote unquote sorrowful tactics and sorrowful agenda. Uh, so, for example, um, portray, por portrayals of death in their uh, protest tactics. Um, uh, they demand the disaster justice uh, and um, a reintroduction, reintroduction of uh, the political quote unquote in the dis discussion of post disaster policies. Uh, so. Uh, rather than seeing post-disaster uh, policies as something that is uh, technical, um, the uh, this organization uh, reintroduces the idea of uh, conflictual positions among different actors. So uh, mainly the demand for disaster justice is uh, distributive in form. Uh, 
it is uh, the, the demand was really uh, the, uh, asking for financial assistance in terms of a uh, 40,000 peso emergency shelter assistance, as well as um, a, a distributive form of disaster justice, but again, but it was framed as uh, again, uh, being against the, the distribution of harm, which is in this case, a, distri a distribution of the no build zone policy. So uh, coastal areas were targeted for a no-build zone policy, which is uh, a revanchist, an anti-poor uh, position uh, that uh, basically um, uh, uh, targets uh, poor households uh, rather than, for example, uh, McDonald's was able to uh, rebuild uh, beside the coastline immediately after uh, typhoon. Um, in terms of framing tactics, um, so uh, framing basically how uh, an, a social movement actor makes sense of its environment. Um, this uh, is a diagnostic form, meaning how uh, the problems of society are being uh, understood. So in this sense, uh, there was this idea of a quote-unquote criminal negligence. So as you can see in this um, photo that I took, uh, in uh, to the 2015 protest, um, it says sa justicia para hantanan ng biktimahan kriminal na pagkasibaya ang gobyerno Aquino, uh, justice for all the victims of the criminal negligence of the Aquino government. So, but basically, because of the framing of uh, the diagnostic framing of criminal negligence, the uh, prognosis, no, the the prognostic framing, meaning what are we to do? Uh, basically lent itself amenable to a confront confrontational tactics. So, uh, yeah, so in this sense, um, like uh, direct protest actions, um, throwing of paint in a government agency office during the Duterte administration, uh, so on. Oh, sorry. Um, Okay, so uh, in social movement theory, uh, there is also this idea of political opportunity shifts. So basically, um, the uh, constellation of alliances uh, that is formed uh, that may facilitate or constrain social movement action. And the Duterte administration uh, marked a shift from a combative uh, stance during the Aquino administration towards somewhat a wait and see or a critical collaborative stance uh, following a uh, Lamchek and Sanchez's uh, general uh, overview of the uh, of the national uh, democratic left's relationship with Duterte, which really uh, took a nose dive in 2017. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, I, I'll be wrapping up. Sorry. So uh, yeah, um, but uh, part of the article uh, talks about this uh, particular uh, shift in the D in the in the DSWD um, opposition. So moving forward, um, yeah, this is actually my last slide. Um, the, the my article doesn't talk about other forms of disaster justice because uh, these weren't really foregrounded during the mo mobilization. So justice as recognition uh, wasn't really an, uh, in the agenda. Procedural justice, um, the, the organization basically was not interested in in participation in the in the rehabilitation processes, um, but also uh, moving forward, uh, how is the uh, disaster justice uh, demands from other types of social movements? Uh, Philippine scholars are familiar with the different strands of uh, social movements in the Philippines. So this can uh, frame how disaster justice demands uh, are facilitated, but really basically um, uh, how is disaster justice perceived by the state? So this is a gap in my research. Um, but something that is really a fruitful opportunity for others. How how does the state perceive these demands? Um, uh, and then yeah, and of course, basically, I I, I tried to show uh, like a, a collapse of the social contract. But uh, the social contract can be think uh, think uh, one way to think about it is really as uh, ebbs and flows. So like, how can this be renewed in future uh, disasters and so on? So uh, yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, my, my apologies if the presentation seemed uh, chaotic and I look forward to uh, the questions. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much, Dakila. Yeah. Not chaotic. Yeah, thank you, Dakila. Oh.
and not chaotic at all. Not chaotic at all. Um, very, very interesting. Let's have our next speaker, Justin. Take it away. Thank you, um, OJ. Thanks, CERN, for the opportunity to present my research uh, on climate resettlement. So without further ado, let's move from Tacloban to Iloilo. But before that, let me present the global context first. One of the major consequences of climate change is the forced movement of people due to changing weather patterns and long-term degradation of ecosystems. The IPCC, in its latest assessment report, estimate that around 3.5 billion people currently live in areas that are highly vulnerable to climate change, and that more than 1 billion people will be exposed to disasters from sea level rise alone. In 2021, 22.3 million people worldwide have, were already internally displaced within the borders of their home country due to extreme weather events. And so communities and governments are proactively adapting to climate change, including through the permanent movement of communities to less exposed shared destination sites. And this phenomenon has many names, planned resettlement, planned relocation, um, managed retreat, climate mobility. Uh, pre but preparing for relocation is an emerging priority for governments and communities facing the sobering realities of climate change. To date, the IPCC claims that there is insufficient evidence, and you can see that in the figure in front of you, to judge the effectiveness of resettlement as an adaptation to climate change. But it has acknowledged that previous relocation has had adverse outcomes on communities. But it also claims that when unavoidable, active involvement of local communities and populations may lead to successful outcomes. And so yes, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so this project wants to add to this knowledge based on what are the impacts of plan planned resettlement and its implications for justice. Let me now zoom into the Philippines. How widespread is resettlement and planned relocation in the country? Bauer and Wiran Singh he identified 308 cases of planned relocation around the world, identified from English peer-reviewed scholarly articles. The Philippines has one of the highest number of identified cases of planned relocation. They identified 29 cases of planned resettlement, second only to the U.S. So, despite several calls from scholars to use planned resettlement as a last resort, this is not happening in the Philippines. Resettlement is an often applied adaptation strategies across the country. I use the theoretical lens of disaster justice as mentioned in the special issue. While there is no agreed definition of what disaster justice is, Scholars argue that the concept lies in the intersection between environmental, climate, and social justice throughout the four phases of disaster management, prevention, preparation, response, and recovery. Dakila mentioned the different types of justice, distributive, procedural, and recognitional justice. And I, but I would like to push this a bit further and argue that the capabilities component, the capabilities approach, as espoused by Sen, Nospom, and recently by the likes of David Schlossberg, could be used as a metric for justice. According to the capabilities approach, justice is not simply having income or commodities. Instead, justice is about achieving certain capabilities. That is, opportunities that allow people to do and to be, you know, to achieve quality of life. So there is injustice when there is when people are prevented from achieving capabilities to achieve valuable functionings. The literature also cites two different kinds of capabilities. Core capabilities, which is, for example, the ability to maintain good health, but sec also secondary capabilities, which facilitate the advancement of those core capabilities, such as the ability to eat healthy food, the ability to exercise. So while there are many types of capabilities related to human life, right? for example, health, mobility, education, my focus is on one particular capability here, which is political capability. And the reason why I'm focusing on political capability is this is exactly what the IPCC claims to be an important criterion to achieve success in resettlement outcomes. So I wanted to test this hypothesis that you know, if people were more involved, if people were more active in resettlement planning, then the outcomes may be equitable or just. But what exactly does political capability mean? Well, I would conceptualize political capability as um, comprised okay, 
of three different things, three different secondary capabilities. First, voice, the ability to raise your concerns and to be recognized. Second, participation, the ability to participate meaningfully and to engage with powerful stakeholders. Third, empowerment, the ability to be informed and capacitated with knowledge and skills. John Ensor and colleagues explain what the achievement of full political capability looks like. And they argue that it's when you're able to gain full and equal partnership, when your rights are recognized, the historical roots are recognized, and when people have control over decision-making processes. I now turn to my case study. My project looked into the Iloilo flood control project funded by the Japan Bank from 2002 to 2010. The objective of this project is to renovate existing rivers to dredge canals and waterways to construct floodways to divert water to the sea. Several communities had to be relocated to make way for this project. Four NGOs help out. NGO A, B, C, and D. NGO A is the largest and most politically connected NGO and offered a superior resettlement program compared to the other three. 172 households were referred to NGO A based on an assessment of their income and their capacity to service low interest loans. In contrast, the 1,080 other households were assisted by other NGOs, B, C, and D. They were provided with prefabricated houses that were free of charge. The houses were smaller than the ones provided by NGOA and were only one story high. So, so to explore people's perceptions of their political capabilities and how these are enhanced or undermined by the resettlement project, a household survey was administered um, from April to July of 2018. The sample was justified according to the population size of each of the four NGOs um, and then this was triangulated by 25 semi-structured interviews with government officials, with NGO staff, and community members. So let me share with you some of the research findings. In terms of the voice, the survey respondents reported significant differences in the degree to which they felt that they were able to voice out their thoughts and concerns. Of the four NGOs, those resettled by NGO A reported feeling more able to express their voices compared to the other NGOs. Two major themes emanated from the interview. First, public forums. NGOA members are able to participate in monthly forums where they can express their questions and concerns about the resettlement. Second, community to community sharing. NGOA members were invited to attend workshops, discussions, and meetings where they shared their ideas with one another and with the other um, housing NGOs that are part of the nationwide federation of NGOA. So there's knowledge exchange, there's dialogue on best practices. Second, on the component of participation, out of the four NGOs, those resettled by NGO A reported being more involved in the planning of their relocation compared to the others. Two major themes were occurring from the interviews. First, participation in the entire resettlement process. NGO A involved its residents in all stages of the resettlement project, from planning to design to the procurement of materials and to the housing construction. Second, participation in governance. NGO member, members take part as steering committee members and have signed a memorandum of agreement with the city government as partner in its different relocation projects. Third, components empowerment. Respondents from NGOA express greater satisfaction about the extent of their involvement in the planning of their relocation compared to others. They attended workshops and training sessions to learn about housing design and laws related to housing. They were taught to do financial estimates and to procure housing materials and were introduced to the different stages of housing construction. On the other hand, there was no indication that the residents of other NGOs attended any kind of trainings or workshops such as these mentioned by NGOA. Now, these differences in enhancing political capabilities translated to concrete outcomes. There's a significant difference among survey participants regarding their perceptions on the resettlement project. Residents from NGOA were more likely to feel that the project improved their lives compared to the others. They claimed that their access to services improved. But one of our respondents said, uh, stated, quote, it seems like life is better here. It seems like we're living in an exclusive private subdivision, which is so different from where we used to come from. On the other hand, the residents of the other NGOs 
sites were complaining about issues such as water, sewer systems, and poor drainage. Two more slides. Th this slide shows the actual photos from the houses constructed by the four NGOs. You will see that the houses from NGO A are well designed, are, are quite beautiful, are, they look sturdy. On the other hand, houses from the other NGOs tend to look you know, dilapidated and of poor quality. Residents even complained that their houses still got flooded during the typhoons. The table shows significant improvements to basic services after resettlement. However, it also indicates significant inequalities in improvement to service. Those who were resettled under NGOA were more likely to have improved basic services compared to those relocated by other NGOs. So this study, just to conclude, this study underscores the importance of building political capacities, building political capabilities, and expanding people's participation in resettlement projects. There should be a shift from victims to full partners who are worthy of respect and esteem in decision-making processes. In our study, those with higher political capabilities experience more transformative um, relocation outcomes. But there is another finding that can serve as a warning. What potentially can happen when you build the capacity of one group but fail to build the capacity of other groups. This could lead to the inequalities and further vulnerabilities of already marginalized groups. And so it is important not to leave any group behind. Another important point, building political capabilities of communities are not as simple as straightforward. There is always a need to interrogate whose voices, whose perspectives, whose values and identities are included and are enhanced in the process. Finally, to answer the question, which is the title of my presentation, is there a potential for disaster justice in planned resettlement as adaptation? There is no easy answer to this question. But what this study highlights is that disaster justice is context specific. What can be regarded as just or as fair for one community may not be just and fair to another. Look at this from the perspective of NGOA. It is fair, it transformed them, but on the, from the perspective of NGOs B, C, and D, it's unfair, it is not transformative. And so what this highlights is that resettlement in itself is not black and white. And so critical narratives about resettlement that you know it will always lead to distributive justice should also be taken with a grain of salt. However, despite this uncertainty and context specificity of climate resettlement, it should not preclude action to foster disaster justice in ways that distribute its benefits more equitably. Ultimately, the study highlights the need to place marginalized groups at the center of resettlement praxis to advance transformative outcomes. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you so much for that, Justin. Um, we'll move to the next presenter, Pamela. Um, yep. Hang on, let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, so while my computer is warming up, okay. So yes. thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, it's so great to see familiar names and familiar uh, faces on the screen and to be with colleagues who are um, interested in research and advocacy for disaster justice. So my presentation is based on a collaboration between anthropologists and architects. And so with me um, is my fellow anthropologist, uh, Professor Monica Santos of the UP Diliman Department of Anthropology. And for this project, we collaborated with architect Simon Cervantes and Olivia Almasicam from Mapua Malayan Colleges of Laguna and my colleague at the UP Diliman College of Architecture, respectively. And we would like to thank Brown University Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies for providing us the seed funding to do this research. Okay, uh, sorry, my screen is not moving. Okay, so um, I won't belabor uh, uh, the, the disaster context uh, in the Philippines. I feel like Riden and uh, Dakila and Justin all did a great job in, in uh, exposing the disaster context and the challenges um, in the Philippines. Um, I'll just say a little uh, quick thing about post-disaster housing reconstruction. 
out of all the different phases of disaster risk reduction and management, you know, uh, uh, preparedness, response, um, being the other two, it's the aspect of disaster management that we least know about that has the most uh, number of mixed results, and that's because of its complexity. It's very expensive to undertake post-disaster housing reconstruction, so very few organizations are willing to take it on. Um, also, because of its challenges, you have to build within a particular time frame, but also meet uh, quality standards. And of course, the challenges also include corruption uh, um, in the post-disaster housing reconstruction uh, construction center. In the Philippines, the literature points out that the challenges are elite capture uh, of post-disaster housing reconstruction resources, disaster capitalism, and a big gap uh, between implementation and policy. Um, so much has been said about the politics of uh, post-disaster housing reconstruction, um, and especially from participatory and community lenses. We contribute um, to this discourse and especially the discourse of uh, about disaster justice by looking at material culture. Um, the gap that we're seeing is uh, many of the studies about post-disaster housing reconstruction and the politics of it uh, treat the material world as if it's an empty canvas in which politics unfolds. But what we're trying to assert here is that disaster injustice unfolds through and because of the material world, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Okay, so while my computer is warming up, I'll just talk about um, the different uh, theoretical frames um, that have guided us in our study. Um, key to our study is uh, the work of George uh, uh, Greg Bankoff on disaster injustice. Um, and basically what he talked about were the cultural scripts um, through which blame has been accounted for throughout history. In the first, uh, for the most part of Spanish colonization, disaster was seen as an act of God, a punishment um, of God for the for the sins uh, of uh, Filipinos. And so, when the state responded, um, it was really arbitrary. It really depended on the gobernador general at that time and their inclination to support those affected by disaster. When the Enlightenment spread. Um, uh, to the Philippines um, in the late 1800s. Um, and then along with that was the modernization of governance as well as the use of technological innovation um, for governance and um, especially with the establishment of the Manila Observatory by the Jesuits. Um, uh, from uh, disasters being an act of God, it now became uh, a natural uh, disaster. It was nature's fault. Um, but then that that thinking changed around 60s, 70s, when there was a realization, especially in critical disaster studies, that disasters are not caused by the environment, but are actually products of uh, uh, society, and particularly the bad decisions of those in power. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen um, and then try to reshare it again. Can you see the presentation? No. I wonder what's wrong. Hmm. Uh, can I ask? Um, I, I uploaded the presentation to the shared folder. Can I ask na lang the help? Um of my collaborators so Baka you can see it we'll try to download it Pam, and share it from my end okay. i'll try i'll try because it's really not um but anyway i can i can talk ab about the ano na lang, the the theoretical concepts while we do it again Try it again. There, can you see it? Yay, okay. I won't do presentation mode na lang para hindi ma ma masira. Okay, 
So aside from Bangkok, we're also looking at, uh, we're also informed by uh, ideas of disaster injustice, particularly by Shrestha et al. 2019. So they operationalize disaster injustice um, in three on three levels, accountability disaster, which is the state not uh, being accountable for disaster outcomes, representation failure. And I think that has been also tackled by Justin's and um, Dakila's presentations. And knowledge disaster is basically failing to, to integrate you know, the lived experiences and situated knowledge of those affected by disaster. And very key to our presentation is the concept of material registers. Um, this is from the anthropology of architecture. So material registers are socially informed ways by which we perceive and construct material configuration. So the question that we're trying to answer here is, how did post-disaster housing reconstruction register um, to the people affected uh, by disaster in our case site as well as other actors? And of course, we're also informed by the interplay of disaster justice and housing by um, several authors from the Philippines, some of whom are part of this panel today. So our research questions are, how does post-disaster housing reconstruction register to the island community? And how does disaster injustice manifest in the material registers of post-disaster housing reconstruction? And of course, the third question is, how can we move forward from this? Um, our research methods and techniques were mostly ethnographic. We conducted 42 interviews. We also did 3D model massing and counter mapping with the help of our architect collaborators and also observing while walking in the site, as well as archival research to understand the planning and policy context of the interventions in the area. So um, this is our case site. Um, it's basically... Uh, um, uh, in Manila Bay, and you can see that uh, it's it's the the way to the to the island um, is filled with fish ponds, and this area was uh, filled with mangroves at the turn of um, the twentieth century. About fifty five thousand mangroves, and those have um, been whittled down to a few hundred hectares now um, for because of um, urban development and agri development initiatives in the area, which severely impacted um, uh, disaster mitigation of the area because mangroves um, really did help uh, uh, mitigate flooding, the, the effects of flooding in the area. Uh, our actual case site um, is this island in Manila Bay. It's four hectares. It houses uh, 3,000 people or 700 families. And you can see that you know, the, the, the island is barely distinguishable from the from the water this is an estuarine island um, at the pampanga river and manila bay um, so the, the the flooding really comes from from different areas uh, river flooding of course from the river and then uh, uh, tidal flooding so this was taken um, during tidal flooding i believe in september 2019 so even at this level of flooding um, it's not a disaster quote unquote um, for the people in the area because they can still uh, move. But you know, as, as the flooding continues, their houses really also start to, to uh, become in a state in disrepair. And you can see that the houses are generally made of concrete. Um, there are some two-story houses, and these are um, from the, the more well-off families in the area. But there's, there are also poorer houses, especially in this area, that, is made, uh, that are made of palm and bam bamboo. Now this area, uh, the area on the north um, near the fish pond dam used to have like 20, 20 houses. This collapsed uh, during Typhoon Glenda in 2014 because the dam uh, fell apart. So the first material register that I'll discuss is housing as a roof overhead. This is based on Esther Charlesworth and uh, Ahmed's work on sustainable housing uh, construction that says that housing uh, reconstruction needs to provide outcomes beyond the basic protection that shelter provides. So like health, for example, um, water and sanitation. But um, what we're seeing in the island is that because of the lack of support uh, from, from the government, even the basic uh, concept of shelter as protection is not, it's not even addressed. So one of the poorest um, families in the island is um, a caretaker of the near, nearby Fishpan Dam. 
and they're too poor to even travel for example to the town to get i uh, to to register for id so they can receive ayuda and and the disaster reconstruction assistance from the government so what they're left to do is after disaster uh, after flooding especially when uh, the bamboo poles or the fish corals nearby become uprooted. They go uh, to the riverbanks and look for these found materials. And that's what they use to build um, their houses. And you can see here that the site is even filled with, with mud. So it's also sinking. And so even at the, at the basic um, aspect of site selection, they can't even afford to go to, uh, 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 to more sturdier ground um, in the island. And when we talk, to um, a representative from the provincial gov government who was helping uh, uh, out in disaster um, assistance in the area after Typhoon Glenda, they said, well, the disaster comes from nature. The government just helps. So people should just be happy with whatever is provided to them. If that's groceries, then they should be contented with that because it's not the government's fault. The second material register is housing reconstruction assistance doesn't match essential reconstruction techniques in the community. So what do I mean by this? Housing reconstruction uh, assistance, usually 10,000 pesos, typically after Typhoon Glenda, although the maximum that the government can give is 30,000 pesos, but none of them, even if their houses were fully uh, washed away, did not receive 30,000 pesos. Um, and one of the the uh, the most common ways to to uh, prepare for flooding in the area is to raise the level of housing. So that requires a process of patatambak or filling, you know, where you get uh, mud and sand um, either from quarries or from nearby areas to just raise the housing site. Now you see here in the photo on the left what looks like just you know, normal ground actually cost 18,000 pesos to build, um, which took um, the homeowner about five years to save for it. Um, and you can see that this home used to be a, a concrete home. It was completely destroyed by Typhoon Glenda in 2014 and succeeding typhoons. They built uh, a nipa hut inside the, the area from found materials. They couldn't immediately use the 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 plywood that was given to them because their main concern was really to raise the level of the ground. Similarly, in the picture on the right, um, that's another house that was affected by Typhoon Glenda. There, the neighboring houses were able to raise the level of their homes. So what happened was all, all the flooding, all the waste from the sewage just flows to them because they're on lower ground. And they've given up already on reconstruction because, it, again, for for the filling process to happen, it costs about 18,000 pesos. It takes three to five years to save for that. But one big flood, that's all gone away. So um, it really shows how how reconstruction assistance has, has not been sensitive to the material conditions of the island. Lastly is housing as private responsibility. So according to international and domestic disaster policies, as I mentioned earlier, the state is ultimately responsible for disaster risk management. But Public disaster management projects, particularly in infrastructure, create additional risks, which then again forces people um, to draw from their personal resources so that they can mitigate these risks. So um, what I'm showing here on the left is um, a photo, so the very first photo. You can see that um, this is a basketball court. It's been elevated by about more than one meter. So at the time that we were visiting the, the island, the, the main public areas and the streets were being raised by one meter. And in the middle, you have a Sari Sari store who was able to keep up with the road raising um, initiatives. So their house now uh, uh, is higher than the road. So they're good for another road raising initiative. But the house on the right was not able to keep up with it. So you can see that they're lower than the road. And what they do is they just uh, construct a barrier for the flood to stop the flood from getting in the house. But that's often not enough, especially during uh, typhoon season. So what can we conclude from these registers? First of all, is investigating material culture of disaster context has rich potential 
to nuance disaster injustice, and disaster injustice primarily manifests as accountability failure. It's basically the state not recognizing that um, those affected by disaster are citizens, not just charity cases who should be happy with whatever um, the government can give. And then it also shows the structural nature of disaster injustice. It's easy to, McKeown says that it's easy to point the blame on specific agencies or specific individuals, but the research shows that disaster injustice is, is spatial, it involves a lot of actors, and it's really a systemic problem rather than a problem of single individuals and single um, agencies. And just a few recommendations moving forward. We can prevent knowledge and representation failure by centering the lived experiences and situated knowledge of those disaster um, affected uh, communities in, in planning for housing. We can prevent accountability failure by strengthening the disaster literacy of disaster managers. Um, the concept natural disaster has really been abused in uh, state narratives about disaster, which really absolves them from the responsibility, even though this is um, enframed in, in our laws. And also integrate a futures thinking approach to disaster management to move away from reactive rather than tokenistic uh, disaster management. And with that, I'll end my presentation. Again, I'm sorry for the technical failures and happy to have further discussion about this. Thank you very much, uh, Pam. Now let us have our final speaker, uh, Kyra. Kyra, go for it. Thank you so much, OJ. So let me just now quickly share my slides. I hope you're able to see them. Why is it? Are you able to see them well? Hello? All good, Sarah. Okay, <laughs> I was just like, I thought I was freezing because no one was answering. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, particularly, again, it's great to, to see people from CERN. Uh, we go way back. Um, thank you for adopting uh, this one Sydney-based uh, scholar to <laughs> the group of Melbourne-based scholars at that time. It was really such an important um, space for me uh, as we were all you know, in that sort of dark spot during the pandemic lockdown. So this was such a, an important space for me to really connect with people and to continue um, thinking about, you know, the very topics that we are having uh, this conversation on. Now, just sorry, listening sorry. to all... Sorry? Or... Paano ba? Pinad Kasi pinadala lang sa akin yun ni Mamus eh. Pinadala yun ng Oika. Tapos... Okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought someone was asking a question. Um, so, okay, so listening to all the, the, the discussions uh, earlier, um, I was really inspired by, you know, the depth as well as the nuance that uh, our contributors had brought into the conversation around disaster justice. And I feel that it, this is a really important contribution. And uh, we have... Uh, furthered or advanced that argument that really, as Justin said earlier, context matters. Um, and of course, this is just part one of our special issue. That's one thing I would like to highlight. Um, we do have a part two. Um, and uh, in that particular um, collection, we will talk more about different aspects of disaster justice as well, uh, particularly around knowledge production, around indigenous experiences and how that relates to uh, disaster justice as well as um, the question of, of care and how disaster justice can be rethought from the lens of care. What I'm presenting now is not really from my uh, uh, a research article or a research uh, paper, but really um, the presentation focuses more on reflections in the process of producing uh, this special issue with my co-editors, uh, Riden and Pam, which is uh, a love project for two years, um, and engaging with the works of uh, various authors, as well as generally, you know, taking into account or looking back into what I have produced as uh, a feminist in disaster studies over the last 12 years. Many of these thoughts are still emergent, um, but one of the many things I've been thinking of these past couple of years is trying to connect 
my own academic research and my foundational experiences as an activist in the Philippines, which becomes more relevant when we talk about uh, this issue of disaster justice. And uh, I've been hearing a lot this idea of, you know, uh, when you do academic work, it's just theoretical, but what does it really, how does it really relate to practice? How does it really relate to lived experiences? And I, I find that sort of binary division as some, somewhat problematic because coming from a tradition of feminist uh, uh, theorizing and feminist activism, um, we do not see these binaries because feminist theories really do emerge from, you know, uh, place-based, contextual, and lived struggles and experiences for um, justice, among other things. So for me, the theoretical is political and also definitely also personal. So often when we even and here, I've been thinking about this notion of solidarity. And when we uh, we invoke the notion of solidarity, I was wondering how we can go into some kind of collective thinking around how solidarity forms the spirit of research. Um, Reden mentioned earlier that uh, we have a photo gallery uh, as part of the special issue. And uh, actually, just looking and going into that uh, being part of this collection of uh, photographs and, and uh, the, the photo gallery, it spurred this re reflection because it took me back to an embodied journey when I was researching recovery in Tacloban. And the photos reminded me of my own embodied presence in these sites as a researcher and how I felt during that time and the different and new realizations that process brought into being. And so this led me to think about really the importance uh, of reflection um, and reflexivity. And sometimes it gets thrown away around so casually, oh, we're doing reflexive research, but really thinking about reflexivity and how do we operationalize it in our own um, practices. And um, I've found these spaces for reflection in the many conversations I've had with a community of scholars, as well as activists, practitioners, um, community-based organizations, and really the people I've been engaging with, um, CERN being one of them, so special mention, <laughs> um, producing joint projects together, special issues, and the conversations that go into that, webinars, civic actions, and also looking at past work and looking forward and, and seeing yourself, you know, in that uh, temporal space before your PhD, after your PhD, and so on. So it led me to think, how do we situate ourselves when we study disaster experiences? And sometimes that gets forgotten because we just focus on the data being presented and forget to put ourselves um, in our work. And what role do we take as an observer, as witness, as advocate, as something else? And how do we navigate our the troubles of our own positionalities. And uh, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, as special issue editors and some of our um, contributors as well are, of course, Filipino, but also have navigating these um, positionalities of being in um, Northern universities. So these are all troubles that we continue to think about. And lately, of course, as part of my privilege to become a part of a broader network of disaster scholars in different parts of the world, we have been engaging with a disaster studies manifesto that really puts into the center of discussion the ethics and politics of doing disaster research. And if you have not um, uh, looked at the, the manifesto yet, so it's, it's good to engage as well and to think about um, where we situate ourselves as researcher researchers and how we do our practice of researching disaster context. And part of that, um, and my reading of, of this growing conversation among critical disaster scholars is to help reshape disaster studies agenda, to deconstruct how we know disasters, to reconstruct our field using anti-colonial and pluralistic perspectives. And this is, again, I have to emphasize why uh, context matters and engaging in genuine conversations, not just among 
disaster researchers, but uh, with those who, uh, who the longest time have been merely the, ob the, the object of study, you know, the local communities affected populations, especially in places we call the global south. So how to incorporate an explicit adherence to aspirations for justice is my um, contribution to these uh, discussions, especially in the context of this special issue. And do we do research in solidarity or do we need to reconceptualize our notion of research, perhaps as from a more activist perspective, research as solidarity? And this is a, a passage that I have drawn um, inspiration from, which I am trying to embody in my current work, which talks about as a performative practice, academic research is activism and it participates in bringing new realities into being. Therefore, Critique is important, but at the same time, how do we make visible these certain practices, ways of doing, ways of being that counter unjust practices, unjust ways of thinking, and unjust systems? And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kyra. I mean, there's really so much to think about and to discuss. Um, I'm, I'm having all of these ideas and feelings after listening to all our speakers, but I am sure our discussants this afternoon are equally excited to, to weigh in on the concerns that our speakers um, raised in their individual presentations. Without further ado, I would like to transition to our discussants, and we have three this afternoon, the first of which is a critical urban geographer and an urban political ecologist. Um, she is currently completing a PhD at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit, or DPU, at the University College London, or UCL, researching what she calls, quote unquote, resilient city making in post Ondoy Metro Manila. Friends, I would like to introduce to you Maria Christine Tin Alvarez. Take it away, Tin, from Hong Kong, I believe. Thanks so much, um, OJ and Bonita, for um, moderating. And to CERN, um, thank you for organizing. Also, thank you to uh, Reden, Kyra, and um, Pam for inviting me as discussant. And congratulations to the editors and, of course, to the authors and contributors, to, to Dax, uh, Justin, Monica, Simon, Olivia, Jin Brick, and Brooke. Congratulations. Okay, um, so... Uh, for, for a long time, um, Philippine scholarship on disasters has focused on community-based disaster risk management, or CBDRM, reflecting the priorities of communities of practice, NGOs, and donor agencies. This analytical focus on CBDRM continued even after the 2009 Ondoy disaster, which catalyzed a shift in the framework, a shift in the framework of DRRM from disaster response to disaster risk mitigation. In my own work, um, explicating resilient city making in um, Metro Manila, I've noted that this uh, this paradigm shift has instead reinscribed the focus on disaster preparedness and mitigation in policy, in practice, and in scholarship. So this is not to say that CBDRM is um, not important. Of course, it's 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 essential uh, as an essential intervention, especially to um, uh, especially when we're talking about impoverished and marginalized communities that always bear the brunt of disasters. But um, I think that this analytical, this sort of analytical focus shies away from, from the political. It's, it, it, it's inattentive to uh, the political economy to, and to the political ecology of, um, of disasters. So um, years after Greg Bankoff's landmark um, publication on cultures of disaster, critical cultures of disaster, critical uh, critical perspectives in the literature, in Philippine literature, Philippine disasters literature started gaining a foothold uh, only in the years after Yolanda. That's what I've um, observed through my review of the literature. And I think emerging scholars were very central to this, um, to surfacing the, the 
uh, the more political, the more critical perspectives of the Philippine disaster studies. It was early career researchers, new lecturers and assistant professors and newly minted doctors and PhD and master's students that brought attention to the political economy and uh, political ecology of disasters. And this important work continues in the forthcoming special issue. And I think it would interest everybody to know that the authors and contributors joining us today were among the, 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 the scholars, that the early career scholars that forged a path for a critical turn in Philippine disaster studies. And I think the SI builds on this and as the first thematic issue explicitly on disaster justice, it sets the agenda for a more um, political, a more um, critical, and perhaps even a more um, radical approach to understanding disasters, uh, disasters in the in the Philippines. So I think that's, uh, that's one of the major contributions of um, this, this SI. And uh, I think uh, a, a common thread that I've, uh, I've, I've noted is the articulation of um, disaster justice in terms of mobility justice and housing justice. It's um, the, of course, uh, Pam, um, Ky Kyra Riden, and Pam in the in the editorial, and also um, Dax, Justin, and uh, yeah, everyone else actually uh, speak to resettlement, speak to issues of resettlement and post-disaster housing reconstruction. So it was inter very interesting for me um, to note how uh, questions of mobility justice and questions of housing justice are really um, in are really uh, embedded in in their discussion of of housing justice. We see that throughout the the articles in this um special issue. So the attention, I think the attention to the built environment, to the to the landscape, to to mobility, um, to to housing and to communities, to to communities that uh that populate these um settlements is really um it's really a, a an it, it's really an important um uh, it's it's an important uh turn and when you when you consider what has um been produced what's what kinds of scholarship has been produced on disasters in the in in the philippines and as a scholar of radical housing justice this to me is a most welcome development so i think yeah so uh, i i guess um my 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 questions would revolve around uh around that um i just have um three for each of the for everyone so first um my question is how has the r how has the rrm the rrm agencies and entities failed to think in terms of housing and mobility justice in governing disasters in in the areas that you've uh you've done field work in and second in your view uh is the goal of disaster justice making resettlement and post disaster housing more just and more equitable or is the goal necessarily more demanding as in transformation and uh third earlier justin mentioned that uh justice is uh con context um context spe specific if 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 that's the case i'm interested to learn about your insights about how how critical disaster scholars like yourselves can guard against the the malleability and the 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 abuse of the concept of disaster justice that's um that's all for me and really uh it's really great to to hear your presentations and congratulations for such an amazing um SI. I can't wait to read the final version. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much for that, Tin. And thank you also for making time um, for, 
for everyone. Tin is um, catching a flight and really tried her best to be with us today. And I think you'll be, you'll need to go off pretty soon. Um, have a great trip. But I was wondering if it's okay with you to post the questions in the chat so that we can, um, yeah, we can have a look at it later. Certainly. Yes, during the Q&A. Thank you so much for Thank that. You. Um, our second discussant is an assistant professor at the University of Brunei Darussalam's Department of Sociology and Anthropology, where she teaches and researches on issues relating to health inequalities and disaster experiences in the global south. Um, we'd like to welcome Maria Karines, Karines or Karin Alejandria. I hope I say that right. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, yeah, you got it right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. I've, um, uh, I'm just floored to listen to all of you give your thoughts. And of course, the very critical um, points that Tin raised. Um, fantastic group of uh, scholars here. As a Filipina scholar, this um, special issue cannot come at a more important time as our country face complex and compound disasters, which are often framed as inescapable natural occurrences from which affected communities ought to survive as part of their DNA as resilient Filipinos. And our editors have already mentioned this earlier um, in their uh, introductions. Uh, so I commend the editors first uh, for bringing this love project, as Kyra mentioned, to the light, despite all the challenges. And of course, I'm pretty much assuming a lot of resistance from others who will read your work. And so such a courageous, uh, special issue. So again, congratulations to all the authors and the editors for doing this. So I have, um, uh, uh, I've done like, um, specific comments for each of the presenters. Let me start with Pam. So Pam uh, introduced a very uh, a fresh trope in intricately examining materialities of disaster injustice in an island community. By integrating anthropology and ar ar architecture, the article pioneers the concept of material register, revealing how housing reconstruction post-disaster is embedded in specific social, economic, and political realities. I appreciate this novel approach as it shifts the focus from the abstract notions of justice to tangible material dimensions, emphasizing the need to consider the physical aspects of reconstruction as integral to the broader discourse on disaster justice. Notable as well is the influence of power dynamics and governmental policies in post-disaster housing reconstruction. A critical exploration of how social hierarchies and economic structure shape making processes could provide valuable insights into addressing material injustices. And I keep on learning a lot from every time I interact with Pam about these things. Um, so my question for Pam is, um, how does the innovative uh, integration of anthropology and architecture, particularly through the concept of material register, contribute to a critical understanding of disaster injustice in an island community or island communities. Furthermore, in exploring the influence of power dynamics and governmental policies on post-disaster housing reconstruction, how might a comprehensive examination of social hierarchies and economic structures enhance our ability to address material injustices in the broader discourse on disaster justice? All right, moving on to uh, Dakila. Again, thank you, Dakila. Um, it's wonderful to see you again. We keep on um, intersecting in multiple events. So for Dakila, um, Dakila contributes um, uh, introduces another innovative trope by framing disaster justice within the mobilization efforts post Super Typhoon Yolanda. The article highlights the demand for justice by People Surge, emphasizing distributive justice for disaster aid and critiquing the state's action as criminal negligence. A very powerful uh, thing to say, though. Um, uh, again, I, I don't know how readers will um, will uh, respond to this, but a very powerful thing to say. Uh, the incorporation of political opportunity uh, structures adds a dynamic layer to the framing of disaster justice, acknowledging the evolving social political landscape as a crucial factor influencing justice demands. 
I also appreciate the exploration of people's surge framing of disaster justice by investigating the power dynamics within the mobilization. Critically assessing the effectiveness of framing strategies in shaping public perception and policy response can guide future advocacy efforts, ensuring a more nuanced understanding of power structures. So my question for Dakila is, in what ways um, do the incorporation of political opportunity structures provide a dynamic layer to this framing, um, acknowledging the evolving sociopolitical landscape as a crucial factor influencing justice demands? Additionally, uh, the exploration of power dynamics within people's surge mo mobilization uh, that you've highlighted um, how might a critical assessment of the effectiveness of framing strategies in shaping public perception and policy responses guide future advocacy efforts and contribute to a more nuanced understanding of power structures within the concept, context of disaster justice? And then um, next is to um, Justin. Um, I, I love the um, the comparison of how relocation um, was um, experienced uh, per NGO. That's um, that was really uh, very informative. Um, your contribution is a unique trope uh, as you uh, spotlighted planned resettlement as a climate adaptation strategy. In recognizing the neglect of disaster justice in resettlement planning. Your paper explored the procedural, recognitional, distributive justice issues in a climate resilient project, resettlement rather, project. By employing mixed methods and identifying divergent experiences among resettled households, your research challenged conventional perspectives and introduced a nuanced understanding of justice in the context of climate induced resettlement. It is also interesting how your paper engaged in the potential unintended consequences and power imbalances in planned resettlement. I love that a lot. A focused examination of the assumptions and ideologies underlying the concept of disaster justice can contribute to shaping more equitable, effective, resilient strategy, resettlement strategies rather. My question for you, Justin, is through the exploration of procedural recognitional and distributive justice issues and the identification of divergent experiences among resettled households. How does your research challenge conventional perspectives and offer a nuanced understanding of justice in the context of climate induced? Uh, furthermore, uh, your paper delved into potential unintended consequences and power imbalances in planned resettlement. How might a focus uh, how might a focused examination of the assumptions and ideologies underlying the concept of disaster justice aid in shaping more equitable and effective resettlement strategies? Uh, thank you again uh, to the organizers, especially to Riden, Kyra, and Pam for the invitation to join you today. As I told Riden uh, when he invited me, how can I say no <laughs> to all of you? Uh, so this is this is such um, uh, a privilege to join you this afternoon. So if anything, one of the clearest points anyone can take away from this is that disaster, as Pam has been advocating over and over again, disasters are never natural. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much for that, Karen, OJ. Yeah, thank you very much, Karen. Um, again, one thought after another, one provocation after another, wonderful, wonderful piling up of thoughtful comments and reactions. Our final discussant is Maria Carmen Ica Fernandez, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge's Department of Land Economy, studying the relationship between protracted internal displacement, customary property rights, and land governance. Ika is a development professional who has worked for over 13 years on the intersections of governance reform, peace agreements, forced displacement, land rights, and urbanization in the Philippines. Ika, take it away. All right. Uh, good afternoon from Cotabato City uh, and congratulations to the SIR network. Um, uh, I'm uh, so happy to be part of this webinar and um, 
it was amazing to to finally see this um love offering of yours after two years of struggle um it's not an easy task to to, to do scholarship in the middle of a pandemic and then other issues so uh i think it's it's a great time to celebrate uh, this kind of release so um I'm also very uh, happy to be to have been able to listen to the work of scholars. I've only been able to admire fr from a distance. Um, and I also apologize that I'm not able to um, open my my uh, video. Um, the internet here in, in BARM is not the best. And I think it also points to the kinds of structural issues we have when, when doing scholarship, but also given that this place in Mindanao, where I, where I mostly work, uh, we also had a 7.2 earthquake uh, a couple of days ago, uh, but although the epicenter was in Sarangani. So anyway, um, it just reminds us of the kind of urgency that um, that we deal with these things, uh, a, a dual urgency, but also a, a, almost like an everydayness, um, even as we talk about Haiyan after 10 years. So Tin and Karin are both hard, you know, um, hard acts to follow, and they've said quite a bit. So in, in the rest of time, um, I just want to uh, do two things. Uh, one is to be able to, to um, commend this initiative for being able to contribute to the uh, the small but so, uh, slowly uh, growing uh, literature on critical engaged scholarship in the Philippines on disaster justice. And I have to be transparent though, I, I, I identify myself less as a disaster scholar but more of someone working on armed conflict and governance. And uh, my engagements with disasters, environmental disasters have and mostly been when they become complex disasters, when uh, armed conflict intersects with typhoons and then other um, hazards. So, but either way, um, there is this acknowledgement that we need to be able to, to, to speak of what you have just, uh, you know, so beautifully uh, laid out this afternoon. Uh, issues around uh, justice uh, being uh, multifaceted around governance and financing, around the agreements we have uh, with the state and with each other, around social movements and student organizations, uh, and um, something close to my heart, uh, being able to understand it in, in a grounded space and place in terms of the design and materiality of, of uh, these particular agreements. And of course, as uh, scholars and the practitioners, uh, being reflexive and, and uh, honest about the ways we think and work around uh, uh, these issues and engage with with communities. So um, it's something that, uh, as um, Karine mentioned, um, might not um, uh, always be accepted, given that we do um, work in a space, whether as academics or as Filipinos, um, that tends to be very um, not right wing, but but a bit more uh, towards the the everyday and the technocratic. And so uh, having this kind of of um, effort this is something we need to do more of um so that leads me to to i guess um both my provo provocations but also my questions for for the group no um and the funny thing about academic writing is that it tends to crystallize thought in a particular moment moment in time like the Kila was saying is a is a long um long process of like a seven year eight year process of, of writing and yet even even putting the papers out took two years for the the research and and publication team and so um i'm i'm it's interesting for me personally to to ask you guys about how um I guess your thought thought has changed even in the two years uh it took to get uh this collection out, no? Um and if for example the fact that we survived the pan a pandemic and it's not quite over yet and uh so many other crises, how does it change your, your ways of thinking about disasters and disaster justice? Uh, and I want to be able to raise the concept of the poly crisis that TUS is, uh, is, has been uh, bandying about. No? And the reality is we are not, I mean, as scholars, we tend to um, to privilege, like focusing on one uh, tiny aspect of reality, but then we are looking at multiple waves and levels of, of crisis, no? uh, um, both uh, tangible of war, of, of, uh, of, of information, of of uh, political uh uh division no and, and so I'm curious to see how you guys um begin to think about your own pet areas of, of research in terms of the poly crisis um while um also thinking about what Justin mentioned around uh I mean seeing the poly crisis even within the particular context and geographies that we work in uh while also placing <laughs> marginalized groups in the center of the praxis so that's one maybe uh, how does your how did your um, scholarship scholarship evolve and change particularly with the poly crisis and maybe second is um, a temporal aspect of this work no because I, I in my own work I think of it as a protracted continuum that even for example if you engage um, uh, whether it's 
Tacloban or or Maguindana or or Marawi or or Holo where I work, no, um, you're not looking at just one particular event, but multiple ways of events. And so, how do we begin to think about these things in a continuum? And I'm curious to hear um how again the temporal aspect um of, of uh, change and and thought in your lives. So yeah, again, thank you very much for your time. It's been an amazing uh two hours, and I look forward to hearing your answers. To my questions. Cheers. Great, thank you so much for that, Ika. And, and of course, for all of the discussions, I think we have a um, very, very robust set of questions that um, we will need to respond in 10 minutes. And I don't think that that is enough, <laughs> but we will try. And um, if there is anyone, I don't know how you want to do this, but it's up to you. Um, if you want to kind of like, maybe have just a general statement to respond to the questions rather than um, addressing all of them, of course. Um, and also inviting the others to respond via chat or to ask questions via chat. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll have one round um, from, from all of you. Um, if there is anyone who is ready, you can have a go. But OJ and I thought... Yeah, um, is it okay if I uh, go first? Great. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Dean, uh, Karin, and um, uh, Ika uh, for uh, the comments. Um, uh, I, 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 can, I, I hope to address uh, some of the questions. Um, for for Dean, um, your question regarding the uh, DRM agencies and how it failed to think of uh, justice, um, I think, at least in the case of the Cloban, um, I don't know if it's a thing of uh, failure, but uh, this is something that um, uh, Kyra also points to some of her work na, uh the agencies were really thinking about saving lives in that sense. So they wanted, so they thought they, they, they really uh, have this uh, like benevolent um, thought. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it seeing like the state, uh, even if you have the best intentions, uh, in J James uh, in J James Scott. So even if in the best intentions, uh, things can still fall apart. Um, for for uh, for uh, uh, Karin's question, Kanina, I really cannot um, address it uh, systematically. But I really like the point about perception regarding the calls. Um, uh, audience perception of social movement um, demands is a very flourishing line of inquiry uh, in, in, in abroad. Pero in the Philippines, um, no one really touches on uh, how the audience uh, perceive, uh, like for example, if a protest movement calls for something, how, do, how does the general audience perceive it and how it relates to efficacy? So uh, yeah, it's, it's a fruitful uh, line of inquiry moving forward, uh, not just in disaster social movements, but uh, a lot of social movements in the Philippines. Um, for for Ika's question, uh, I really la like the you know, um, the question about how the thought has changed because uh, really uh, this uh, work uh, that I have been doing for seven years now, um, it, I really agree with the point that academic writing uh, crystallizes your thought process at a particular moment in time. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree that uh, the COVID COVID pandemic really has uh, changed. Uh, and I think uh, I, I was part of a different work, also civil society um, mobilizing, pero uh, in many uh, online work. Um, but it it points to uh, like how 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 can social movement uh, thinking uh, change? Um, it it can change uh, in terms of uh, the technologies that can be used to uh, to uh, organize. If if people cannot uh, gather together or meet face to face, um, there can be other ways, and technology can really facilitate this. Uh, these processes. So, uh, yun, uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, go over the questions uh, if I have time and maybe comment via email. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that, Dakila. Anyone wants to follow or shall we call on Kyra? Is, did you call me, Bon? Yes. yes. Um, maybe I'll just, uh, just for in, in the interest of brevity, I, I would like to address the, the comment uh, made by Ika on, on uh, uh, you know, crystallizing our thoughts, you know, and then take this, this publication process is taking so long. And I, and I do agree with that. And I do struggle with it many times. Um, but uh, very, very quickly, I also feel that um, 
publishing in journals um, is not the only um, output uh, or outlet that that we can set our um, minds to as as academics. And I and I've been really thinking about that more and more, um, especially in the light of what I have presented and how we can. Um, frame our research as as solidarity and and a lot of that a lot of times it, it requires you know uh acting with and 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 you know um supporting certain types of actions which cannot wait seven years <laughs> for, for publication so really to to um support other platforms for for uh, putting out uh, the knowledges that we produce so that it becomes accessible not just to other academics but also to communities of practice and activism that uh, we want to reach. Thanks, Kara. Um, Pam, maybe your um, final words? Sure. I think I will address Karin's question first on anthropology and architectural collaborations because that's specific to our uh, presentation. Uh, for me as an anthropologist, collaborating with architects, it's been so useful to understand how um, the material world really reproduces injustice. For example, um, walking with them on the island, I can see uh, a seawall that's broken. And I know I can see it with my two own eyes that it's broken, but they can expound on why you know that shouldn't be happening. They take one look at it and say, ah, ito kinapos ang nagtipid sila sa bakal. Um, or they 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 scrimped on on steel, and that just um and which confirms the the or, or not confirms, but which maybe um uh relates to how the islanders feel about corruption in the disaster uh, uh mitigation and reconstruction process, and of course what they uh, they also are able to see. The different ways in which people are uh, rebuilding um, uh, in terms of, say, the height, the actual height of the, the houses that are being rebuilt and how this can help mitigate uh, disaster on a household level. Again, also highlighting that when we talk about disaster affected communities, they are not monolithic. Um, they have different resources across different communities, different skills, different access to technology. So collaborating with architects um, really helps with that. And then I'm just going to make a general uh, a point about disaster literacy and the understanding of no natural disasters. I think that would address several questions in terms of where the gaps are when it comes to um, the governance of um, disaster justice and where we can make it better because that is the problem really is that um, either uh, due to ignorance or or unwillingness to talk about the political aspects of disaster. I work in a lot of uh, multi-sectoral contexts and when you mention politics, people are so allergic to it. So, and that really makes me concerned because how can we how can we make things better if we're unwilling to have these different this th these difficult conversations um about about politics and it's so convenient of course when people deny the politics because it's so easy to slip in you know purely technocratic um approaches for example or deny state accountability for disaster and then maybe my third point will be how has my practice changed um over the years i've always identified as a practitioner rather than um, an academic. But what um, the sort of research has made me realize that by the time we talk to practitioners and engage them about you know, uh, the political aspects of disaster, sometimes it's already too late. And the mindset has already been, um, has already coagulated and been solidified at that stage. So one of the Things that I've started to do is, I, you know, I, I've gone back to teaching um, because I feel that education has such a, 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 a powerful uh, potential to really unsettle all these um, deep-seated notions um, about disaster. And I, I am an anthropologist, but I embedded myself in the College of Architecture in UP, and my PhD was also in the College of of architecture, and I feel that you know social sciences, especially, has been uh, ignored um, in this conversation, especially when it goes to technocratic um, 
approaches. And I'm just thankful that there are colleges who are open um, to what I have to say as, as a social scientist. But my big concern really is how do we, I mean, we all kind of understand each other in forums like these. In a way, we're preaching to the choir. And I think my challenge to everyone is how do we go beyond the choir in advocating for this? And I've worked with Karin. Karin knows um, we, we try to do all these multi-sectoral uh, forums and it's not, it's not easy. Um, but, you know, we try to do um, what we can um, to, to um, Christine's point, do, do we choose between improvement and transformation? I think we need to do both. Transformation is not going to come overnight, but we need to be brave enough um, to acknowledge that it needs to happen and to hold those accountable. And where we can, where it's difficult to, to, to do conversations about transformation, then we, we try to improve um, where we can by having multidisciplinary um, engagements. And I think I will end there. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you for that. And um, just to... okay. I just wanted to in the in interest of time, I just wanted to respond to Tin's very important question again about how do we guard against the malleability and abuse of the concept of disaster justice? And it's such a hard question to answer. I'd like to answer it in two ways. First, I think it's important to have that core concept of what justice is and what it entails. And if you look at the literature, there is some consistency around what justice is, right? And what, what it involves. There are certain metrics that need to be met. And Dakilas mentioned this distributive, procedural, recognitional capabilities. I guess what brings them all, you know, is a common focus on the poor, the powerless, the marginalized. So for me, that should be one of the ultimate measures of justice. Is the project enhancing the freedoms, the capabilities, and the opportunities of the poor? That's one, one way to look at it. But the other way to look at it is actually one of the reasons why I highlighted the context specificity of justice is to guard against the top-down, you know, templates, blueprints of what justice look like. Because this tends to feed into, you know, universal best practice, ideal development projects, um, what, what this might look like. So, but these are mainly developed, you know, externally and out of context and out of country. So I guess one way to respond is to co-design, you know, co-develop these indicators of justice with communities. So to, to end, you can imagine, sorry, it's so good. Look, but you can imagine this as two components, you know, justice is universal, but it is also local. Justice is macro, but it is also micro. It doesn't have to be either or, it can be both. Uh, but I guess what's important is we don't forget that the core principle of justice on the one hand, but also be flexible to acknowledge other ways of understanding justice and be open to other forms of knowing about what justice is. Thank you for that, Justin. And I think we have space to extend for about 10 minutes. And then um, we'll have Monica, I think, who wants to um, speak as well. And then after that, we're done. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, OK. Um... No, I was just going to, I wanted to address, I think it was the last question on the continuum of disasters. Um, I guess in our research, it wasn't really more, it wasn't, I didn't see it in terms of a continuum, but more of a compound, like, a, like compounded factors that was um, kind of one on top of the other that was adding to the uh, situation of the residents in the island. So I, of course, the, the temporal element is there in the sense that, you know, the, uh, what, it's one disaster after another, but I think there's also the kind of uh, the systemic, the systemic issues, I think, is what stood out to me in our research. So aside from just looking at, you know, it's one disaster after another, it was also just a compound of factors. Um, for instance, that would make a particular family decide to just leave the island, you know, to kind of give up on 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 their houses. So it wasn't for me, at least. I didn't see it um, as a continuum of disasters, in that sense, or not just a continuum of disasters. I don't know if that um, sort of addresses the question. <laughs> Okay, thank you so that for that, Monica. Um, Riden, for and maybe yeah. if you can also speak a little bit to the question. There's a question that's posted on the chat, if possible. Chat, okay. 
Uh, okay, so very quickly, I'll respond to Tin's very first question. How have the uh, DRRM agencies and entities failed to think in terms of housing and mobility justice in governing disasters? Because a lot of my uh, research also speaks to mobility and housing issues, you know, informal transport and informal settlements. In uh, the paper that I've been working on for more than two years now as well, and it should have been uh, included in this SI, but... I just didn't have time to finalize and you know put together all the empirical insights because of other responsibilities. But uh, it's looking at the context of Cagayan de Oro City, looking at post-resettlement uh, context after Typhoon uh, Washi. Uh, and, and when I was interviewing people, when I was looking at the documents, you would obviously see the lack of coherence in terms of looking at the framework. Uh, last night, I was giving a midterm oral exam to my students at UP. I was also teaching part-time at uh, UP's School of Urban and Regional Planning. And I was always emphasizing the importance of the theory of change to, to, you know, to highlight how we can get to certain idealized scenario or to, as I think Tim uh, mentioned the importance of transform scenario or transform situation, transform condition. But in our policies, in our policy making processes, there's no way you can see clearly and coherently how mobility and housing justice issues are integrated. And it's difficult because when you look at justice related issues, uh, it's always neglected. Some of the approaches are very fragmented, reactive, and very technical in nature. You all know that when you talk to planners, they always speak in like, you know, they're, they're not speaking in language that we normally understand. Very apolitical. And of course, justice issues are political in nature. It entails institutional and political interventions. So I think that's one way to look at it. Uh, look at the theory of change, to what extent this theory of change of our government officials speak to, you know, the different dimensions of justice. And in one of my slides, I mentioned I didn't have time to elaborate on the notion of policy epistemologies. Why the word policy epistemologies? Why combine them? Because as a scholar, I, fr I look at policies, not just, you know, the usual framing is that policies are techniques of implementation. These are the tools, the instruments, the apparatuses of the state through which they impose their authority. But we also need to understand that policies are also ways of knowing. These are concrete expressions of our belief systems, the way we look at realities, the way we look at supposedly idealized scenarios. And if we don't integrate justice-related issues, there's no way we can, of course, integrate or look at the different relationships between housing, mobility, transport, and of course, livelihood issues, which is one of the key research agenda of, of mine for over a decade now. And in relation to the question, how do we popularize or how do we somehow make it more acceptable? Because as Pam was uh, saying, we're probably preaching to the choir. But one way to uh, look at it is really to look at institutional dimensions, to look at our institutional systems, but also to start talking about justice. You know, our role as scholars is to unsettle the way things are. So that's also the very reason why we were convinced that this is a, this is a special issue, but this is also an important intervention because no one was talking about it. So the moment we unsettle the way things are, that's also a concrete step to probably popularize or make the term, the concept, the approach more familiar, more understandable to many people. Otherwise, you know, it will always be abstract. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. And I think at that um, note, we'll kind of um, end the sessions. Um, 
And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, um, wherever you are right now, <laughs> different parts of the world. Um, OJ sends his apologies. He had to leave for a class that he's teaching. But I think we are both in agreement that we were given the gift of moderating this exciting session, which I think makes a landmark contribution to the discourse of the critical turn on disaster justice in the Philippines. So congratulations to the team, to the editors, to the authors. Thank you to the presenters, um, the discussants. And then also as a reminder, um, the session will be, the recording of the session will be available through the CERN YouTube channel soon. And the special issue um, is going to be published by the Philippine Studies Journal. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Thanks a lot, Bonita and Thank OJ. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Everyone.